I noticed in other religions, there's an appeal towards heavenly rewards, perhaps some of these other religions that emphasize the fleshly desires will be satisfied in the next life, you know, this continuation of relations in the next life or of, you know, different ways of satisfying the flesh, really. But in Orthodoxy, Christianity, um, Apostolic Christianity, it seems like there's an emphasis that just to be in communion with the Lord is the reward. I forgot what saint said it, but it was something along the lines of he wouldn't care if he even went to hell as long as he still, like, you know, can, can be in somewhat of a relationship with God. And um, which obviously that'd be somewhat antithetical in that sense, you know, because hell is a separation of God. But the idea that being in communion with the Lord is the, is the goal versus like, what are all the things that I'm going to get? Like some of these other religions talk about, you do this in, in this life and you'll have a palace in the next life. And, and for me, that, that turns me off because I don't care about those things. And in fact, there's a lot of even philosophers, Stoic philosophers that are higher than that. So people that don't even believe in God can surpass that. So I, I mean, I think like guys like Marcus Aurelius who have denounced the, the fleshly desires, you know, the sexual temptations, the gluttony. I think even those guys were, were more ascetical than some of these other religions. That's a great, great observation. So how does, how does orthodoxy approach? How should we look at the afterlife? That's a great question. Marcus Aurelius is funny because if I read him when I was young and he's this great stoic and everything. Then I found out later he's one of the worst persecutors of Christians ever. Very interesting how you can look at someone and say, they had this and yet they could destroy the Christians. But in relation, especially with our conversation about you know, missionary work and, and orthodoxy versus Mormonism, LDS church, it's very interesting. It's, you know, carnal. It's a very carnal religion in a certain sense. Like you're going to go and it's, people mock this, but you're going you're to be a God kind of like Jesus is. You know, Jesus has become a God and by, and you're just behind him. As God, I think it says, as God once was, you now are, and as he is, you shall become. So you're just kind of become, and you would become Jesus, and you'd have your own planet, and this kind of, this is not a joke. They really do believe that. And there's more to it. I'm not mocking it at all. I don't think it's true at all. I think it's ultimately, I'm totally blasphemous, but this is their belief. So, but it's kind of like, you're going to have great relations for eternity. You see what I'm saying? Like that the life will continue in a, in a carnal cycle. The joys of eternal life are the same as the joys of now, only they just are more or last longer, like we were discussing. You know, you're going to have great relations for eternity. You know, it's going to be great Coca Cola for. I mean, I'm being a little hyperbolic, but not really. You see? So the promise would be a continuation of this life, but only the good stuff and the bad stuff would go away. Like there'd be no death and sickness and stuff. This is low. This is low for Christians. This is, you, St. Porphyrios, I believe, is the one who says, Lord, even put me in hell if, if I'm there with you. And again, you can't take that too far, but you see the point of what he's saying is that the purpose of life is to be united with Christ. This naive way, heaven's up there, hell's down there, be a good boy, check the boxes off, and then, you know, life stinks, you die and go to heaven. This is kind of pie in the sky. Salvation was never the ancient church, never what orthodoxy understood. I think St. Maximus says, if you don't taste and know God in this life, then you won't know him in the next. It's a scary, scary but true idea. So the purpose of life in this short life is to repent and to come to know God, or to begin, at least begin that process such that he'll give you that in eternity. So you have to begin to put off the worldly things. The very, because these things don't, the, the kingdom of heaven is not food and drink, right? We know this. And the fathers speak beautifully about this whole analogy that when you first come to Christ, oftentimes you come to church or you come to Christ because you're afraid of going to hell. That's not bad. It's good. I mean, I think at the beginning of my walk, I was afraid of my sins. And if I keep living like this, I'm going to go to hell. That's patristic and biblical, and I think that's true. But you can't stay there, right? So you can't stay in this kind of like, like this, but it's a darn good place to begin to get your backside out of sin and into, into the church. And it's a motivator, right? And the fathers say that's an introductory faith. Then they say there's the faith of the mercenary, right? Which is, no longer am I here because I'm just terrified. terrified. I have experienced some of God's love. I'm here because I want the rewards of heaven, right? I want to be in heaven. I want to be in the saints. I don't, you know, I don't, not that I don't so much don't want to be in hell. It's now that I look forward to that. And I want to, and this is not wrong either. It's a beautiful thing to want the kingdom. We say in the memorial service, 
give them rest where there's neither sickness nor sorrow nor sighing. I mean, it sounds pretty nice. That's what I hope for. But it's, it's all those things because you're with Christ, as we'll, say, as we'll say in a second. But even that's an imperfect faith. The fathers say, we open with the faith of the perfect, which is we do it because of love. Like St. Porfirius, a great saint, would say, it's not even about, I don't even care if I go to heaven. In other words, that was his point. So all I want is Christ, because Christ is everything. You know, outside of Orthodoxy, people pray, like, what do you pray for? I pray for stuff. I pray for Johnny not to have cancer. I pray for my parents who are divorced to get back together, you know. And my parents don't, don't get back together, and God must not exist, and so God's a tyrant. You know, this kind of, if people knew what, what prayer really was, they wouldn't have more trust in God, you know. And the Orthodox, you read an Orthodox prayer book, and these ancient prayers, for those, by the way, who think Orthodox prayer is formulaic and not from the heart, how awesome is that millions and millions of people read the same prayers every morning and every night, different languages throughout the whole world. When you stand at your little icon corner and you read these prayers, you're in this, I would say, more than any other Christian body in the whole world, you know, even though we're going to be smaller than Catholic, there's more people actively saying these prayers. That's so powerful. That's not unspiritual. It's very spiritual. But the idea is to be united to Christ. And the prayer book says... Like, it isn't like, God, give me this. It's, thank you, Lord. Glory to you, O God. So glorifying God, thanking Him, confessing all of our sins. Like, way down on the list is, hey, God, this is happening. If, this, if you could help. But thy will be done. You see, it's so humble. So, like, praying isn't like asking for stuff. That's what the average person thinks, right? But St. Paul says prayer is just to be with Christ. To be with him. He says, you already have paradise in this life if you have Christ. So if you're repenting and you're praying and you're putting off your passions that are obstacles and you're receiving Holy Communion, you're tasting heaven in this life. When someone receives Holy Communion, in orthodoxy, the servant of God, so and so, unto remission of sins and life everlasting. It's a passage. It's for, for life everlasting. So it's a, it's a tasting of the next life, right? So this is the faith in the perfect. I'm going to do it because not to get stuff. Like you said, I'm trying, I'm trying to put off that stuff. And precisely the way to get to that place of love, this faith of love, is we have to deny ourselves in this life. God forbid we say that I'm going to be a Christian and I'm going to be a good person so I can, you know, so my, my sins and passions and addictions can continue somehow blessed. What if I do this and I inherit a bunch of virgins after I die, you know, like in different, in different religions? Or, but I think Christians do this too. Sadly, they have a false idea. of, uh, But for us... One priest told me a really scary thing. He said he had someone who was quitting drinking in an alcohol problem. And he said, you know, in heaven, will I be able to drink? You know, without a consequence, without a hangover, it was just going to be... And the priest kind of wept and said, you know, if you only knew the freedom that's available in Christ in this life, to be free from those passions, you won't want that. That's hell. He says, you know, one of the... He says, when you pass into this next life, before the second coming, our body dies, goes into the ground, to await the second coming of our Lord, or our soul will return to our body. But then the soul is separated from the body. That's unnatural. We're not made to live. You know, we're made to live with a resurrected body like Jesus, which we're all going to receive in the second coming. But when the soul separates from the body, it's unnatural and terrible. But you know why it's terrible? It's not terrible to the saints and those who have fought the passions because they put all their eggs in the basket of put up where wrath, what moth doesn't get or rust does. So if you are really addicted to food or to alcohol or to drugs or to sexual passion, now you have, the desire hasn't left your soul and now there's no body to fulfill that sin. It's like a perpetual itch that you can't scratch. Whew, that really struck me as deep. That, that would be hell. That would be hell to like, you know, all your yearnings would be for physical things that now you can't actually manifest anymore. So that tells you that the purpose in this life is, yeah, we have to eat and sleep and, you know, like marital relations are blessed and all these things. But if you're attached to them and you can't leave them behind, then they're going to plague you. Whereas the opposite's true, right? That if you put them off through fasting, that's why orthodoxy has a discipline of fasting. Not just to check the box off to, to food is food. It's just fuel. It's not passion, you know, uh, sexual temptation, all these things, the ascetical life of the church, which some people mock as saying is monastic. No, it's just Christian. And it's the ticket to freedom. To freedom. And it's the ticket to that, big, that process of purification such that our joys in this life are already of the kingdom of heaven. 
the joys. And that's how the martyrs, you know, I often just look at the icons or read their lives and say, how could they endure being tortured? Like we, we stub our toe and we get like, darn it, and why, is God's, why is God so mean to me? You know what I mean? Like, how could they do that? I think when a person makes steps towards the ascetical life with humility, with saying, I'm going to really uproot my passions, I'm going to go to confession, I'm going to really, you know, I'm going to make prostrations, I'm going to pray, I'm going to, I'm going to really... This is not going to be me. I'm not going to feed this passion anymore. That's a heavenly journey. That's the seeking of the kingdom of heaven within you. And that's how the saints could already taste the kingdom. That's how, that's how because they, when you do that combined with prayer and the Eucharist and the life of the church, you find that kingdom of heaven within you. And then that's how they could endure torture and everything because St. Paul says, death, where is thy sting? Like it's an, that's an indestructible faith. That's not dependent upon like my my comfort or my 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 this and that. And they were human, they were crying out, but you get a little bit of a taste if you live the spiritual ascetical life of the church. Monks and moms chasing kids no less, if we're serious about it, that you taste the kingdom of heaven in this life, right? And and you can endure. And you see how they can endure the gulag. How could they endure these things? And it seems so far from us, but then slowly we can as weak as we are, that we can grow in that. And it's a foretaste of the kingdom of heaven. And I think this is what makes orthodoxy different than anything else. And that's what not just Jaws LDS people, but me every day. And everyone that's coming. And every priest I know. And every priest you've interviewed. The reason they're all great is that they're on the same journey. And their parishes are full because I think that they're inviting their people on the same journey. Honestly.